In March 2018, we opened our doors to the public with a vision not just to create challenging professional theatre, but to use this as a platform to inspire and bring communities together. Theatre and culture build identity. With theatre and culture in our local life, the community landscape is more vibrant. Local life is enriched. We believe that the benefits of theatre should be available for everyone. Our Theatre for All programme has removed financial barriers, giving disadvantaged people access to the theatre free of charge. So we were told that we'd come here and have a Christmas meal and then go and watch A Christmas Carol. Our aim is to make live professional theatre available to everyone and use that experience for positive change. Theatre can be transformational in young lives. Our academy is now in its fourth year and we continue to build on our vision of bringing the best performing arts tuition to the heart of the Cotswolds. We work hard to make our academy as inclusive and as accessible as possible. Discounts apply for parents with more than one child. Our bursaries help support talented children from less affluent backgrounds. The Academy creates a fun and challenging environment where children can build friendships and develop key skills not just for theatre, but for life. We are also able to provide real opportunities for students who wish to pursue careers in the arts. My name is Harry Apps. I am currently playing Marius in Les Miserables in the West End. Barn outreach and learning programmes engage with thousands of people. Our free workshops support the drama curriculum in local schools. Singing and musical theatre workshops in community groups and care homes have helped address issues of isolation. Our Song for Sirencester project in aid of mental health charities brought our community together in an unprecedented way. We've collaborated with many charities in the region, including the Churn Project, to support individuals dealing with the barriers to finding work. Since working at UN, my life's changed. It's given me some purpose, given me an interest, some confidence I was lacking prior to all this. The Barn Theatre played a pivotal role in the town's 2018 World War I centenary celebrations. Who could forget our record-breaking human poppy? Our live streaming work on the annual Advent Festival helped thousands engage and take part in Sirencester's Christmas festivities. In these times of uncertainty, we strive to keep the community together. The theatre may be temporarily closed, but our commitment to you goes on. Even now, our amazing costume department are helping the NHS by making scrubs for frontline workers. We've used our technology to build a free live streaming service that provides much needed community news and entertainment for all the family. Broadcasting every day to keep us all connected. We are not just a theatre. We are the bar.
Another week in lockdown. This is Cotswold District Council Live. Good afternoon and welcome to Cotswold District Council Live. My name is Councillor Joe Harris and I'm the leader of Cotswold District Council. Welcome here to the Barn Theatre in Sirencester. I'm joined today by Councillor Andrew Doherty, who is Cotswold District Council's Cabinet Member for Waste and Recycling. I'm also joined by the star of BBC Three's This Country, Paul Cooper, who you may know plays a character called Martin Mucklow, a local of these parts. So once again, a big thank you to the Barn Theatre for hosting us um, here today. Uh, fantastic asset here in the centre of Sirencester, and they've really transformed their operation um, from, from conducting shows to shows like this. So we haven't got people here in the Barn Theatre, but we are able to um, talk to you and present to you from the comfort of your very own home, you lucky, lucky people. So we're going to be with you today for about half an hour, um, and even perhaps 45 minutes, depending on how we get on. Um, we're going to have an update on the bins. We're going to be joined by Councillor Paul Hodgkinson, who is going to join us via video link. Um, he's the Councillor for Bourton on the Water and North Leach on Gloucestershire County Council, and he'll unpack a little bit about what the County Council do as opposed to the District Council. Um, we'll have an interview with Paul Cooper um, about clearly about this country and the impact that's had on his life but also um but also about how he's found lockdown he's lived here for a long time now haven't you paul <laughs> yes 33 years Is it only 33 years yeah. marvelous um so we'll have a bit of a discussion about that and then as we go on we'll be making note of your questions that you ask during the broadcast so um so yes so get those to us so as I said, we're going to start um, with business. We're going to go over to um, Andy Doherty on my left-hand side, and he's going to give us a bit of an update on the bins. Andy. Okay, a um, few things to talk about this week in terms of what's going on with the bins. So most notable thing since we were last giving an update is that the Garden Waste Service has launched again, um, and we're now collecting huge volumes of garden waste. So I think in the first week we were on to about 300 tonnes of waste we picked up, which is more than we picked up of pretty much anything else. Um, the recycling is running about the same as it has done for a while now, about 20% more than we're normally picking up, and that's fairly stable over time. Food is still continuing to go up, which is surprising to us because we're not sure where it's all going. But at the minute we're picking up food and that's still gradually trending up week on week in terms of the amount we're collecting from you per household. And one of the side effects of that is, again, trying to fit everything into the vehicles. So one of the things some of you may have noticed is that we're not always able to pick up all the paper. So at the minute, we've got a temporary arrangement. So it's quite often where we're coming to pick up your paper the following day, rather than on the day it was originally scheduled. And there's different crews and different vehicles coming to do that. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be making some more changes to the vehicles and the service. So we can try and get all the paper on at the same time we're doing the main collections and pick up absolutely everything in one go. We've not had too many problems with the garden waste service in terms of missing things. Obviously, all of you have been trying to get as much as you can into the bins. They've generally been okay. We've had a few that have been so heavy, we literally can't get them on the lorry, but not too much of that. But one thing to bear in mind with the garden waste service is we're only able to take the bins that you put out that are our green bins as provided to you and have got stickers for 1920 on them already. So we're not picking up from older containers that don't have stickers on them. We can't take side waste. We can't take other bags you might put out. And that's simply to make sure that we get up as much of the material that's out as possible. We get it on the lorries in a predictable way and we don't leave too much behind. If we started picking up everything that you could put out, we'd literally have no space on the lorries and we wouldn't be able to get everything on. So bear with us while we do that and try and stagger and stage the material that you've got out over time. If you've got it in the bin, we'll take it, it'll be gone, reuse that bin, pack it well, neatly, not too heavy, ready for the next collection, and then just keep going on like that until we've caught up with whatever you've got out. And as we do that, that makes it easier to run, less chance of things going wrong with the service. And that's probably the main things that are going on in the minute. Few hiccups still while we've got higher volumes, but we've got ways of picking those up and catching up on ourselves where we miss anything. So bear with us while we still work through this most recent phase of lockdown, whatever we're now calling it. 
Andy, thank you very much. Um, we've got a um, we've got a paper coming to our cabinet meeting next week that's around the pricing because, as you know, the price of a permit is due to go up. You've got some news on that. Um, hopefully, we'll approve it. Yeah. So the um, provisional price for this year for the 2021 period was going to be £35. So it's gradually going up in stages over time so that we get closer to the £45 a year, which is what it actually costs us. People seem surprised when I'm not encouraging people to sign up for the garden waste service, but that's on the simple basis. We actually lose money on each license we sell rather than making money. So what we've agreed off the back of the consultation we did with you a few months ago is that that price will gradually rise over time till it reflects what the service actually costs to run. For this year, it was going to be £35. Because we've had the two months effectively where we haven't had service, that's had a fiver knocked off, and it will be £30 again for the shortened year for this year. And then in next year, we'll be increasing the prices again to get closer to that real price that it's actually costing us to pick it up and take it away. Great. Good news. Um, we've got a couple of questions trickling in. So we'll take, um, we'll take a couple now that are specific to, to waste, Andy. Um, Joanne Lynham, um, Lynham, sorry, where do you get the stickers from? Where do you get a license if you need a license? Okay, so we are just in the process of finalising the letter that's going to go out to existing customers, um, and that will give you the details of where to go and register. We basically encourage everyone to register online, so there's a web page link you can follow through off of the website. At the minute, that won't let you do anything. At the beginning of June, that will start to go live, and then we'll be accepting people renewing the licences. We do the license renewals and then we post you out a new license, you stick it on the bin, you're good to go basically up until 31st of March 2021 at that point. Great. Uh, we've also got a question from um, Katrina Ross. When do licenses need to be reviewed? Uh, reviewed? Renewed? Renewed, sorry. Renewed. renewed. So at the minute we're carrying on collecting up until the end of June. So I've extended the original 31st of March 2020 date out to the 30th of June. That is the last day in June, isn't it? 30th of June 2020. Um, so it's additional three months on top. So you don't need to worry about having one until the end of June. But our aim will be to get them all out by the second, third week of June. Great. Um, Simone Clark, when are you delivering new garden waste bins for new licences? Okay, so if you're getting a new license, with, we've gone through and we've looked at all the people who have already asked about having a new license who aren't existing customers. And I think so for about 14 of every 15 of them already got a green bin. Um, long, long ago before my time, we distributed garden bins out to pretty much everybody in the entire district. So there's a lot of bins lurking around that are being used for other types of storage or i know they've been used as water butts there's a farm somewhere with about six of them apparently being used so what we're looking to do is to have all of those come back out if people want additional ones and put license on them before we put new ones out the other key thing we're going to do is we're going to take it in careful steady steps because one thing we don't want to do is run up a lot of new licenses and that might not then be able to fit everything in the vehicle so one thing we're going to do is we're going to go slowly on giving out new containers so we can make sure we can collect from all of the containers that are already out there that will now have stickers on them. Once we know what's going on with that, which we'll try and do as quickly as we can, we'll start deciding how and which parts of the district we can let people start to do and buy additional bins and then start to put out more waste maybe than they are currently. Right, Andy, thank you for that, um, for that brief update and keep the questions coming. Um, we are here for the next half an hour to 45 minutes so keep those questions coming if you've got any that spring to mind and we will try and answer those um we're joined now by councillor paul hodgkinson um who is the county councillor for boughton on the north boughton on the water and north leach in the center of the cotswolds paul um can you hear me all right i can great good to have you on the good to have you on the line and you're looking very healthy it must be all of that time in the garden i know you're a keen gardener so um so yeah good good to have you good to have you with us so paul clearly um i lead the district council andy's a district councillor and this show um is sort of about the district council for residents that might not know or perhaps don't know the um ins and outs of the way local government works in our area what does the county council do yeah, that's a good question, Joe, and, and nice to be with you this afternoon. Um, so the County Council is primarily responsible for some of that larger stuff like infrastructure. 
So, for instance, uh, the council is responsibility for uh, responsible for roads in the county. Uh, it's responsible for pavements. Uh, it gives subsidies to some buses. Uh, it gets involved in modelling for train services, for instance. So those are what he call all the kind of transport, roads and infrastructure. Uh, road safety is included in that. And I know in my area, road safety is always a big issue. You've then got other things like care, uh, so social care. Uh, that's caring for older people. And that takes up a massive amount of the county council's budget. And then in addition to that, you've got children in care. Again, uh, it's an area that takes up a lot of the budget. In fact, 70% of the county council's budget is taken up by social care and children in care. In addition to that, you've got what I call smaller things, which are still important, like trading standards. That's the standards by which retailers, etc., and restaurants have to abide by. You've got libraries, for instance, and big planning applications like school applications, um, and quarries, that sort of thing. And of course, education. So uh, school transport, looking after the schools that are still part of the local authority. Many schools are now academies, so they uh, get their money and instructions direct from the government. But those who don't uh, still kind of report into the county council. I think that's probably most of the key things. Well, you've done pretty well to remember that because if somebody asked me to recount everything that the, the district council does, I'd probably be able to name most of them. But, um, but yeah, that sounded pretty comp comprehensive. So, Paul, um, so let's turn to sort of COVID and life since the, since the lockdown then. Well, obviously, our officers and our councillors have been working with people at the county council. Tell us a bit about what the county council have done around COVID. Obviously, the the Gloucestershire Help Hub that uh, our sort of viewers will be, I'm I'm sure I'm sure aware of. That was a that, that's sort of been coordinated by the county council, hasn't it? Yeah, I think I would start with that actually. So the county council has kind of been the focal point really for coordination and public health. I'll come on to public health in a minute. But in terms of the community help hub, this was the central help hub based at Shire Hall and manned by, uh, resourced by uh, Gloucestershire County Council staff who are redeployed. And this is the point where people from the community go to that central hub and say, look, I want help or I need help or I know someone who needs help. My neighbour or friend needs help. Alternatively, it's offers of help. Um, so businesses, neighbours, friends have, have gone into that hub and offered help. And staggeringly, at the last count, there's almost 9,000 people have contacted the health up, help hub since uh, the middle of March. So it's been hugely successful. It's open every day for people to ring or communicate by email. And I think it, it's a really good thing. Joe, if I could just add to that, my thanks for all the volunteers in the community, actually, because, you know, the help hub coordinates things, but it's people on the ground who've made the difference. And... In my area, in Bourton on the Water, there's an amazing 130 street volunteers. I know they've featured on your show before. In particular, uh, Amanda, Linda and Donna, who've done such an astonishing job in getting that working. And volunteers in all the other villages like Chedworth, uh, the town of Northleach, you know, these, these things are frankly superb. So that's a big thing uh, in terms of the community. The other thing I just wanted to mention is public health. So Gloucestershire County Council has a responsibility for public health. Clearly, that's key in this uh, pandemic. And so they are now at the forefront of uh, organising testing. Uh, to, that's public testing in terms of testing for COVID-19 for care home staff and care home residents, because clearly that has been a big issue with COVID-19 symptoms and sadly many fatalities in care homes. So I would say the County Council has been doing those two big things. There are obviously other things, but I know you uh, you don't want me on the entire show talking. <laughs> we'd be delighted to, Paul. You know, we'd be delighted. But yes, we are we are limited for time. In terms of next steps then, the um, clearly we're in we're entering a sort of recovery phase now and um you know you as a county councillor um will have some ideas of what you want the county council to be doing as we um as we engage in recovery and trying to, and trying you know reboot the local economy and get and get people moving again so you know, what what do you want to see in particular from the county council in order to um in order to sort of help help with the recovery well, I think one thing from it, this will help the recovery in terms of economy and health is the promotion of other means of transport other than cars. 
So one of the things, I think the delightful, one of the delightful things about lockdown, and many people have found the joys of walking again. I've got my cycle out of the garage. I've been cycling up and down the A435. Um, and it's been good because um, there's been less traffic. But as the traffic increases, we need to make sure that some of our roads and pavements are sufficiently good and safe for people who are cycling, cycling and walking. So at the moment, um, the county council has asked each of the districts to look at areas in their district, um, such as Borton, for instance, again, where there could be changes to some of the roads to make sure that their social distancing is maximised, that people can get into the centre of a village like Borton safely uh, with social distancing. So there's a real benefit for public health in maybe things like pedestrianisation temporarily. Um, but also stimulating local businesses at the same time to make sure that people feel safe enough to go into the centres of towns and villages. So I really would like to see Gloucestershire County Council doing something on that. I think they're starting to make steps on it. Uh, In terms of the wider economy, I suppose it is making sure that there is a real plan there, not only for retail, but also getting some of our industries back up and running again, because it is going to be a long haul, I think, and I, I fear and we need to give people confidence to get back out there and start spending money. Fantastic. Paul, thank you. If, you, if you're if you happy to, if you can stay on the line, and what we'll do, um, sure. we'll, as we get questions in, we'll put any that sort of uh, to do with the county council to yourself. Um, and it might be that you've got a question for our very special guest of the week, um, <laughs> who we're going to go to now. So I'm thrilled to say we are joined by... Paul Cooper. So for those of you who don't know, or perhaps have had your head in your garden waste bin for the past couple of years, um, a very successful comedy on BBC Three called This Country um, has taken off. Paul, tell us about This Country and then and then we'll talk about you. Yeah, This Country, I mean, it's been a, a, a roller coaster. It was um, an overnight success in that it took eight years, actually, from... from uh, <laughs> From Daisy sitting with this with this camera in our front room, uh, doing a two minute YouTube clip to to actually getting the uh, series one off off the, off the ground. So it's it's had three it's had three series and a special and um, what has won four BAFTAs. So wow. incredible, really. Just just you you know it, it, you you pinch yourself every day. It's extraordinary. I bet. So it's very much a family affair. You mentioned Daisy, didn't you? So Daisy's your daughter. Um, and obviously your, your son Charlie is also another star of the show. So it's a family affair. So what's that dynamic like? Well, it's actually, for, for the kids to write it, um, it's easy because you can tell your brother or sister anything. Whereas if it's a friend or someone else, you, you've got to kind of tiptoe around. So I think they actually found that dynamic really easy. Um, and they just tell it how it is, you know, there's, there's kind of no holes barred i mean we get lots of t- you know com- telephone uh, conversations in the evening oh you know charlie was horrible and oh, daisy was you know, and this was difficult <laughs> oh it was a dreadful day but they they thrash it out and i think that 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 saves a lot of time you know having to be not to be polite to each other absolutely and it's set in it's set in north leach i don't think it's ever given the name north leach in the in the program does it and you play a character called martin mucklow don't you tell us a bit about martin because he's a bit of a uh, controversial character to say the least yeah he's horrible and, and <laughs> particularly, <laughs> particularly um horrible to to carry his his daughter um and that's kind of reflected when i'm outside actually because no one ever comes up to me because they think <laughs> So actually, it was brilliant in Cheltenham um, uh, before, kind of obviously lockdown and whatever. I went there with Charlie. We did our separate bit of shopping, and and we met back. And he said, um, "Yeah, this um, chap came up to me and asked for a selfie." And then he said, uh, "Yeah, I saw that Martin Mucklow earlier, and I wasn't going to ask that <laughs> to, for a selfie. <laughs> Horrible, nasty bloke." So I think <laughs> so. That's the kind of. The kind of normal reaction uh, we've had, but yeah, he's horrible. But it's you know what a wonderful part to play. Yeah, you know, it's great to be a kind of villain. I think I was in something. I'm in the ten top most villains or something on TV. I'm up there with kind wow. of someone from the Bonds. I think you know. Um, so yeah, great, love it. I tell you what, that's an accolade, isn't it? You know that <laughs> that that is that is quite something. So be honest, how how much of the real you is there in the character? Um, 
<laughs> coming more and more. Oh, <laughs> oh God, really? Continues. No, it, it's not, but it, it, it's not at all. I mean, I'm, I'm completely kind of different from him, but it's kind of nice to be kind of playing a baddie. You know, I just it's kind of nice just to... And sometimes the people look at you and think, are you really like that in real life? Because a lot of people... I mean, I had, um, you know, tattoos put on for the part. Um, status quo status tattoo. Quo that, tattoo yeah, that's in a, that's Swindon right. Town and it's stuff. Fantastic. And they had a they had a um, a poll, and eighty six percent thought that the tattoos were real. <laughs> so I think I must look a bit like a villain, anyhow. You know, I think that that's. It's amazing, isn't it? I've I've followed you on social media for quite a while now, and what's quite interesting, and I know that you've actually, you've got quite a following yourself, haven't you? You've got like you've got all sorts of you've got lots of very committed fans, haven't you? What's that like? Yeah. It must be weird. Like. It is. It is strange. I mean, and and they turn up for everything. You know, I mean, uh, quite incredible. We 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 played um, a charity football match um, last summer um against siren town veterans of uh, this country team we had about 1200 people turn up you know well, that's and more coming. than that's more than an average attendance that's, at a siren town home game isn't it like. there's someone from holland and <laughs> you know scotland and they traveled down and just extraordinary it's it's really there's a really been a real cult following you know people seem to really identify with it um and um i think that kind of mixture of the humor but also the kind of the social awareness and, mm. and, and just the, you know, it, it's, it's quite, this, a lot of it is quite sad as well. It must be strange though, you know, because, you know, I know you, you're, you're, you're a down to earth guy, you know, you live here in Sirencester, don't you? You know, you, you're in your kitchen doing your washing up, knowing you've got these fans. It must be bizarre. I mean, I really like, <laughs> it's sort of, you know, I'm relatively well known locally as a sort of, you know, local politician. Mm. You know, most people hold me utter disdain, but like, no, no, that's, that's, that's very unkind. No, um, most of them are very lovely. Um, as, as we've seen doing these lives, everyone's been very lovely. But yeah, I mean, just bizarre, weird experience. So, so you get recognised a lot then, I presume, these days? No, not really. No? no. I, what? Uh, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm very, very, very rarely kind of stopped, um, you know, kind of locally. But sometimes, you know, when I'm out on, um, you know, j just out, I mean, I'm, the other day, well, a few months back, you know, uh, the, the, the person, the young lady doing the barrier, uh, you know, stopped me at Paddington. <laughs> Martin Mucklow. She was, you know, <laughs> her, 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 uh, dressed in... Uh, Kind of Muslim, you know, head head yeah. stuff, and uh, and she, you know, so I think it's it's really for a young Muslim girl in uh, in uh, in London if she gets it as well. It's it's got a kind of wide appeal, you know. Fantastic! Uh, oh, it's it's just amazing. So, Paul, you've you, you mentioned you lived here for th thirty three years, and you know, one of the things we really try to do on this is really celebrate what's great about the area, and clearly a lot of that's born out, um, you know, in this country. Mm. But equally, why do you live here? You know, you know, for all of us, there are much. There are probably a lot. You know, certainly for me, a lot cheaper places to live. Mm. There are, you know, more more linked up. You know, more things to do. Why why do you choose to live here? How, how did you end up here? Quite simple. I I was I'm originally from Biddeford in North Devon, but I moved up to Berkshire in 1971, and I was working for um, electronics company as a field sales engineer in Berkshire and uh, Wiltshire. Sorry, Berkshire and Hampshire. <laughs> Can you remember where it was? And um, and they, they wanted to change change me to, to look after the South West and South Wales. It's a hell of a territory. Um, so I started kind of to commute for about a year doing it, and um, thought, well, you know, it's cheaper in the South West. It, it's kind of time. And a Daisy was four weeks old. Um, it's time for a move. And the place that I loved, I know I would always kind of pass through, you know, going up to kind of Stonehouse or Stroud or, up, you know, up to the M5 or whatever, um, was Sirencester. And I just fell in love with it. And I kind of stop here and you go into Tesco's or whatever and have a sandwich. I could not believe how friendly people were. You know, that was the, the test, going into kind of Tesco's. And Berkshire, I was very different. You know, I lived in a village uh, near Reading and... Um, I, I, I didn't enjoy it that much, and the difference coming to, to Gloucestershire and well, Sirencester was extraordinary, you know. And the kids have been, you know, for, to bring up kids, it is the best place. There's there's nowhere better in the whole country, it, you know. It, it's as good as it gets, and the kids have loved it. And I think that's why they've grown, you know, um, in terms of their, you know, their personalities and their their, their talents. 
living here, you know, going to school at Powell's, Deer Park, which they really enjoyed, you know, um, they just loved it. You know, Charlie played football at Siren Town Juniors for 13 years, you know, from under fives to, to, to under 18s. You know, Daisy did drama here. So it's just a brilliant place. It's fantastic. You know, I did, I was the same. I went to Powell's, I went to Deer Park, and it's sort of, I think, you know, clearly, I can only speak for Siren Sister on the whole, but it's just such a supportive community as well. Certainly in the role that I'm doing now, leader of the district council, on the whole, people are really friendly. They understand, you know, you've got to, you know, you've got to make tough decisions in my case. And yeah, we're, we're so lucky, aren't we? And I think particularly during COVID, we've seen that, you know, with everybody you know, mucking in. Paul mentioned the volunteers, didn't he? Mm. Um, up in Bottom on the Water and in all of our communities. Mm. People do care, don't they? It's sort of oh, it's a, a little cliche. But. Yeah. And that's really why this country got written. Um, you know, Charlie, uh, after he left kind of school, all his friends moved, you know, and, and went to, to London or wherever. Um, and Daisy was up at, at RADA and, uh, for three years and hated it, at, was, was really hated it. And Charlie went to Exeter University for a couple of years and it didn't quite work out and he left. So he went, we said, and, and I'd lost my job by this time in, in electronics and I'm now you know, living in a two, two bed rented place on you know, a Chesterton estate. And um, so we were having kind of tough times, no money. And we said to Charlie, we'd like Daisy to kind of see this through. Could you go up and, and, and stay with her, you know, sleep on the floor? And they had no money or whatever, and, um, and, and it was all a bit kind of big and weird for them. And they just started kind of talking about characters and about things back at home, and it really kind of developed from there. So some of those people, you know... Well, we won't uh, mention any names, but it is quite funny. <laughs> like, you do, you do see people, you think, hmm, I think I might know who that's based yes. on. Like, well, the Michael, you know, Michael Sleggs, Sleggs God bless yeah. him. Um, you know, that was a kind of part, you know, they used to kind of, you know, Daisy was at uh, Powell's and um, Deer Park with him. He was in the, the form above. So, you know, characters like that who, who you know, he kind of played virtually the same character yeah. in, the, in the show. But it was just a love of, you know, and they loved coming back and... Hey, presto, you know. It's, yeah, it's, and of course, you know, you mentioned Michael Sleggs, you know, really, you know, an absolutely fantastic guy. Very tragically passed away last year, wasn't it? Um, after a sort of long battle with illness. Mm. And again, I think he sort of... Actually, I think Michael really embodied, didn't he, what this Completely. country was about. Yeah. And actually, Completely. the whole... You know what it's like to be from the area. Yeah, you know, yeah. you might not know him personally, but you go, yeah. oh, hi, you know, hi, Mike. He'd always say hello. He'd. Always, yeah. I always used to see him. Funnily enough, I always used to see him in the pub or up at Seventeen Black. You know, the nightclub, yes. and he sort of sidelined. And we'd have like we'd have a we'd have a good old laugh. But um, but yeah, I mean that's sort of. I think particularly living in a rural community, that's what it's all about, isn't it? We're 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 so lucky to have that. So, Paul. We first met. Um, we first met properly back last year. I think you came to see me to talk about um, the charity that you work mm. for. So you work for a charity that deals with um, individuals that have um, issues with hoarding. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yes, I've been with them for four years. Um, uh, they're actually a community interest company. They're, they're based in Berkshire, but I, I look after um, uh, Gloucestershire and, and kind of the southwest, mainly kind of Bristol, Bath. So it's working in, in people's house, uh, houses, you know, the, the, who have hoarding behaviours. Um, it's just a fascinating job, you know. It, it's, it's, uh, and we, we have support groups. We have three support groups in, in uh, Berkshire, but we've also helped um, Swindon Borough Council to, to start a support group in, um, in Swindon. And they only had two uh, support groups before, before kind of lockdown. But... Um, it's just fascinating. People you meet again are just, you know, talking about a series or a book. There, I mean, it's just the people are just mm. incredible and mm. you know, very interesting people. And it's a, it's a big growing it's a big growing problem. And I think, you know, after after this lockdown, it's gonna it's gonna be more. It, it affects it affects six percent of the population. So we're talking about forty five thousand people in in Gloucestershire. You know, statistically. Um, and we're talking about, you know, being filled to the rafters so that they're not sleeping in their beds. Um, you know, people aren't having a bath or whatever, you know, uh, because it's filled up with, with, with stuff. So it's, it's been now recognized by um, the World Health Organization um, back in 
uh, April uh, 2018, and they take the NHS take their lead. So, you know, now we're starting to kind of, you know, but it's it's the trouble is I've been on the kind of phone. Obviously, I'm, I can't go in. And I've been phoning a lot of my kind of clients, and they kind of said, "Told you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. And um, a lot of those people are isolated, and and you know when when everyone was scrambling for toilet rolls, you know they they had a few dozen, so yeah, yeah. And 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 they have provisions, so it's it's funny. It's going to be a tough thing, I think. You know, with the people kind of letting go, it's all an anxiety based. There's always triggers. Um, the biggest one is bereavement, uh, yeah. and I think we'll we'll see we'll see we'll see a lot of people because of people who've been bereaved, people who've you know, um, you know, maybe domestic abuse or whatever has been going on during lockdown is, is tough. I think, and, and as, as well, the, the, the point to, to raise would be that with um, people with hoarding behaviours, although it's only 6% of the population, around about one in three fire deaths is hoarding related. And I know, you know, the Gloucestershire um, uh, fire services are very, you know, on, 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 on the hoarding kind of front. Um, Paul Barrett is is someone that I, you know who's come and spoken a lot of our training and who's who's a terrific guy. Yeah, well, I think uh, you've nailed it on the head. When we talk about recovery from COVID, it's not just getting the economy back on track. It's a whole range of things. And I think, yeah, you know, clearly already, I think there's going to be a mental health probably crisis. You know, lots of people needing support at the minute. We know, mm. and yeah, associated behaviours such as hoarding are probably going to increase. So I mean, it'd be good to. Um, yeah, certainly when, when we're a bit freer to to, to me and talk about that a bit more you know i think we'd yes. be delighted at the district council and as you say fire and rescue service that ties in with the county council we've all got to make sure that we're um we're, we're sort of knitting together just sort of finally then paul what you know what's the future look like for you I'm not quite sure, you know, what because of budgets and things like that yeah. because normally you know we we we're funded by um you know the council by housing associations that kind of thing um i'd still like to love to do some acting so there's a few iron irons in the fire there um and i think the kids somewhere along the line will probably write another comedy i think it's be, it'll be very different from this country um you know possibly historic or something something oh, like that so I, I i would love to do something like that yeah Brilliant. Well, listen, you know, you're always welcome back here. And, of course, we've got this fantastic facility at the Barn Theatre. So, so, guys, I'm looking to you guys at the back. Let's get, let's get Paul in, you know. Where's the Paul Cooper show? Come on, <laughs> you've given me one. Let's make it happen. Um, Paul, thanks very much. And, as I said, if we get any questions um, dribbling in, we will make sure we feed those to you. Right, we're going to... Um, I've got a question now um, for Paul Hodgkinson. So, Paul, you're still there. Um, this is from Steve Jones, who I think is in Stow on the World. Can I ask Paul why the um, GCC Community Hub didn't use the NHS Volunteer Responders Scheme when other groups weren't available? Or was there no other assistance available? The Hub was a great idea, but there was a specific reason um, that can be fed back now. Is the initial... Uh, sorry. Da, da, da. Yeah, you get the gist of the question. Sorry, just adding a bit of background. And it might be one of those things that you need to go away and answer and we can get a response to Steve. But yeah, do you know, do you know why, why that was? Well, I, I wasn't aware there was a problem, actually. Uh, in fact, um, I, I know that any request that went into the, the central uh, community help hub then went back down to the local level, and there was a kind of real um, aim there to make sure that there was no overlap with what the NHS volunteers were doing. And I think, although there were a few hiccups, it generally worked all right. So I'll have to take that one away for, for Steve. Um, I thought it was working okay, clearly it wasn't working okay everywhere. Um, in fact, if he wants to get in touch with me with any more specifics, I'm very happy to, uh, to talk to him uh, personally about that. Great, thanks, um, thanks Paul. Um, Andy, I'm gonna pass this one to you. We did have a discussion about it earlier. Um, Bottom on the water, which is Paul's area. He may want to make comment on this um, in a second, but we had a discussion earlier, didn't we, about um, public toilets in particular, um, and we're having a discussion about them up and down the district. Um, we're trying to balance public safety with being able to provide that service. Do you want to just sort of touch on that quickly? Yeah, so um, toilets are not a thing I'm directly responsible for, but quite a lot of my portfolio overlaps with kind of health and public health side of things. I mean, the reason why lots of authorities around the country have had trouble with toilets is the general reduction in things like cleaning regimes and stuff that you've seen over not just the most recent decade, but over many, many years, 
means they're not necessarily being cleaned the way you would need to if you're worried about transmission of diseases like COVID and you've got lots of people coming in and out. So one of the things that a lot of authorities as have included been working back to how do we change the current regime so we can deal with that and you can open up public toilets safely without them worrying about them becoming a route for transmission. And obviously that's becoming a bigger issue now as you're seeing people going for their exercise. Is that what we shall call it? Yes. Sorts of more scenic locations, shall we say. So we're starting to see that in the Cotswolds because we are a scenic area. You've got people coming out. So there's a big drive on at the minute to get those kind of facilities back up and running in a way that is safe. Because your basic problem is you're talking about an enclosed space warm, humid, water, the wind doesn't blow anything away. You've got to really be careful with that kind of environment, otherwise you do seriously have to worry about transmission of diseases, particularly something that at the minute we're all dealing with. So that's something we're all moving and looking at and we talked about in terms of timescales so we can get that up and running in those locations again. Yeah, so I think it's particularly important on the water, we're aiming to get them open as soon as possible, hopefully start of next um, next week. But again, it's that balance to be made. Paul, do you want to just sort of comment on that? Obviously, yesterday, I, I, I wasn't there. I was staying away. Um, but the reports we've got is that it was very, very busy, um, litter everywhere, and almost as if, you know, lockdown, what lockdown? Yeah, I, th I think uh, over the weekend, there was a tale of two halves, actually, if I can call it that. Uh, using a football analogy. So Saturday and Sunday, uh, it was generally fairly quiet and uh, no particular issues. Yesterday, you know, the world seemed to descend on Borton. Um, beautiful day, and I'm sure there'll be more days like this coming this week. So so there was litter, there were litter issues, but people, there were particular issues with the public toilets not being open. I totally accept, I totally hear what Andy said. Um, that there are public health issues associated with coronavirus. So you've got to be very, very careful. But equally, clearly people are deciding to vote with their feet and go to scenic places like Borton. And therefore, it's good news that the public toilets will open relatively soon. I know I've asked you that this morning, uh, and I gather that's going to be pretty soon now that they're going to reopen. Yeah, and I think we we want to reiterate the advice really that the District Council had issued last week, you know, in that if you need a wee on your journey, don't bother coming. If you're far away enough from home that you can't get back to go for a tinkle, then um, you know stay at home um, because you're unlikely to find facilities open. Um, certainly pubs and restaurants aren't open, so it's going to be unlikely that you're going to be able to use the loo. So by all means, come for a walk, um, have a look around, but big numbers of people are a no-no and if you're traveling more than you know 10 20 miles then you know come on guys we, we've, we're all in this together um and i think the big debate we're having nationally um big political debate highlights that we all need to do our bit and it's not fair when others don't um don't do their bit so so come on um great we've got uh what have we got here got quite a lot of people watching Mark Haller, hello from the Costa del Siddington. I've never heard it described like that before. Got a couple of people from, um, from Fever. A few from Northleach. Actually, Paul Cooper, you recorded um, this country in, in Northleach. What was the reception like on the whole? Most people were pretty... Yeah, most, most people were, um, were, were really good. I think there was one lady that wasn't... <laughs> Is this the one that <laughs> were coming... Passing her car in front of the cameras. <laughs> All sorts. I hate this program, <laughs> but you know, each to his own. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that um, you know it, it, it can be annoying for, for for people, but they were very very um, patient, and you know, we thank the people. They were you know, lovely people, and um, you know, yeah. they they uh, they've been very generous to us. Uh, and Paul, you're the county councillor for Northleach, aren't you? What's your sort of perception? Most people are perfectly happy with it. Oh, like anywhere, there are going to be a few, but actually. I, I haven't really heard many negatives at all, actually. No, I, th I think most people love it. I mean, I do. And, uh, and I was asked uh, a couple of months ago by a national paper, what, so did I think it reflected li real life in Northleach? Well, I said, well, it's an exaggerated Northleach, I felt, um, you know, because <laughs> there were things and people that I kind of recognised. Uh, equally, there was a bit of poetic licence, but that's comedy. But I think most people think it's fine. I know some people don't like some aspects, so one a couple of people in particular don't like some of the swearing, said that to me. Um, but, you know, there we go. It is real life in a lot of ways, isn't it? But I think it. I think it's good for Northleach. It's, um, it's put it on the map 
And, uh, you know, I think most people are, think it's good. Funny you mentioned swearing because we had a... Do you remember the, there was a show here at the Barn Theatre that was quite sweary, wasn't there? And I remember... Um, I remember it caused quite a it caused quite a big deal in the in the sort of press certainly some of the reviews and I remember being on a panel here that you and Lewis from Barn Theatre hosted and we had a big discussion about swearing and whether it was yeah I mean it, it got quite a few views on, on on YouTube and it was uh, useful but yeah what's your language yeah. all right I know what you're like Paul um, but no so. Good for North Leach, good for the Cotswolds, I think. And it's quite interesting isn't it, seeing like, Forty Road, for example, in North Leach turned into this sort of like pilgrimage site now, isn't it? You see people sort of stood around like, it's amazing. Like, what about the poor person that lives in that house, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she, she's very, very kind to people. And yeah, I'm she sure. She people all the time. Oh, fantastic. Um, actually, we've got Jenny Ford, who's our, one of our cabinet members, who's been on the show quite a few times. Um, question to you Paul I know you've met Jenny a few times is there anything in particular that we need to think about as a council um, in terms of coming out in support of sort of hoarders and trying to prevent it I think it's it's about um, kind of trying to kind of break the stigma really so that people come and talk um, so it, it takes we say it takes a village um, because it's it's also about kind of looking at the triggers and things so maybe some bereavement counselling if, if someone is you know, there, there's always reasons why people are doing it. So um, it's about kind of awareness, I think. Cool. Yeah, we can certainly help with that. Fantastic. Well, folks, that's all we've got um, time for today. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for your questions. Thank you to the two Pauls and to um, to Andy for being with me today. Uh, we'll be we'll be back in the next few weeks um, answering your questions, keeping you up to date with what's going on in the Cotswolds. Thank you very much for joining us. See you again soon. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's show. To support our programme and all the other fantastic programmes and content that the Barn Theatre produce, please consider making a donation by clicking the link below. In March 2018, we opened our doors to the public with a vision not just to create challenging professional theatre, but to use this as a platform to inspire and bring communities together. Theatre and culture build identity. With theatre and culture in our local life, the community landscape is more vibrant. Local life is enriched. We believe that the benefits of theatre should be available for everyone. Our Theatre for All programme has removed financial barriers giving disadvantaged people access to the theatre free of charge. So we were told that we'd come here and have a Christmas meal and then go and watch A Christmas Carol. Our aim is to make live professional theatre available to everyone and use that experience for positive change. Theatre can be transformational in young lives. Our academy is now in its fourth year and we continue to build on our vision of bringing the best performing arts tuition to the heart of the Cotswolds. We work hard to make our academy as inclusive and as accessible as possible. Discounts apply for parents with more than one child. Our bursaries help support talented children from less affluent backgrounds. The Academy creates a fun and challenging environment where children can build friendships and develop key skills not just for theatre, but for life. We are also able to provide real opportunities for students who wish to pursue careers in the arts. My name is Harry Apps. I am currently playing Marius in Les Arabes in the West End. Barn outreach and learning programmes engage with thousands of people. Our free workshops support the drama curriculum in local schools. Singing and musical theatre workshops in community groups and care homes have helped address issues of isolation. Our Song for Sirencester project in aid of mental health charities brought our community together in an unprecedented way. We've collaborated with many charities in the region, including the Churn Project, to support individuals dealing with the barriers to finding work. Since working at UN, my life's changed. 
give me some purpose, give me an interest, some confidence I was lacking prior to all this. The Barn Theatre played a pivotal role in the town's 2018 World War I centenary celebrations. Who could forget our record-breaking human poppy? Our live streaming work on the annual Advent Festival helped thousands engage and take part in Sirencester's Christmas festivities. In these times of uncertainty, we strive to keep the community together. The theatre may be temporarily closed, but our commitment to you goes on. Even now, our amazing costume department are helping the NHS by making scrubs for frontline workers. We've used our technology to build a free live streaming service that provides much needed community news and entertainment for all the family. Broadcasting every day to keep us all connected. We are not just a theatre. We are the bar.